this Lord's day, let us lift our hearts and voices before our Creator this day of thanksgiving for His provision, His gift of salvation through our Savior Jesus Christ, and His presence through the Holy Spirit. Uh, in our announcements, we're continuing the book club on Monday nights. It's available by Zoom where you can come in person. And we are doing the screw tape letters from C.S. Lewis. Um, very interesting book, and uh, we're probably more than halfway, maybe three quarters of the way done. Uh, but we go through, we basically read a chapter uh, together and then discuss it. Sometimes we do chapters, they're, they're letters, so they're short chapters. Youth group will meet Tuesday night, September 14th at 6.30. Volleyball continues on Friday nights, and we had a big turnout this past Friday, really good workout. Um, we had about nine people in the volleyball. Just, uh, we're getting to the point where we have the whole floor covered. We still find a way to drop the ball in between everybody, but it's fun. <laughs> and a good workout, and uh, really just good fellowship. Uh, some upcoming dates, we've got uh, next week is the worship at the Corn Maze. 10 a.m., bring a chair. Monday, September 20th, the backpack team will be packing at 6.30. <coughs> Saturday, October 2nd, is the Fall Bazaar. October 9th, trustees are planning a work day at the church. The 16th is the Fall uh, Missionary Soup Sale. I heard you're going to sell out. So get your orders in. And uh, 23rd is going to be the fall ladies' night out at 6.30. RSVP by September 12th. I think we need to get materials for it. Today is September 12th, so yeah. RSVP by today. Did I miss anything? Shoebox items need, are still needed. Toys and stuffed animals would be very helpful. And Helping Hands has produced a cookbook with recipes. Remember those things called books that have paper in them? Um, they're still pretty awesome to have. And they don't require power. Well, you should. Um, two other announcements I had. These were passed on to me by Dan McBride from Fredonia this morning at Men's Breakfast. Uh, there are two events coming up for the Fredonia Fire Department um, fundraisers, one on the 23rd, one of those uh, uh, cash prizes things, you can buy a ticket if you want. And there's another one on the, um, on the 4th that's uh, really interesting that Dan's involved in because it's an Amish auction and it's a really interesting event where the Amish are working with the community to help uh, raise money for the fire department. And uh, Dan's very interested in this. It's just, it's just interesting to have the Amish community uh, come together with the local community to support the fire department. Um, so if you're interested in that, that event will be on the 24th from uh, 3.30 to 7 p.m. They are looking for donated items. They're gonna have an auction. Uh, they have an Amish auction here. So if you have any uh, items that you'd be willing to donate or if you'd like to just go take part in the event, that's on May 24th. Mr. Scott? Yes. I do where that will be. Will that be at the fire department? That will be held at the Brenneman Farm. So I have a posting for that. I guess I'll, I'll leave it on the front uh, queue up here if anyone's interested. Sounds like an interesting event. Any other announcements I missed?
patience in trouble, for rain goes after clouds, and moonlight in the darkest night, for wisdom to walk the right path, and peace to calm anxious worry. All the gifts around us are sent from heaven above. So let your song arise and give thanks for all God's love. Our first song will be on the screen. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sins to God. Please join me in the unison prayer of confession. Generous God, you have given us so much. Give us one more thing. Give us thankful hearts, because in our hearts we are and hold. We often hold on when we should let go. We are watching when we should be spending, hoarding when we should be generous, doubting when we should be known of it. We are very fearful instead of trusting in your everlasting care. Open our hands and our hearts to the bounty of your love, which cares for the flowers of the fields, the birds of the air, each child who follows, every parent who worries, every adult who struggles. Loving God, you give us so much so much. Give us again the assurance of your love and care, and fill us with grateful hearts. service. Um, I have to get back to a, a picnic at Union, if you're wondering why I'm wearing jeans today. So I have to get over there as quick as I can, because I totally screwed up. I forgot about the picnic being today. I didn't plan to have somebody fill in for me this Sunday here to make up for it. So I'm in the doghouse over at Union, but we'll get through it. Um, anyway, some things to keep in mind. I Children's message this morning over there uh, kind of leads me to where we're my thoughts for prayer this morning. I heard it said a few more than more than once in the past week that the younger generation is forgetting about what yesterday was about. Um, schools aren't talking about it, teaching about it as much, uh, or in some cases not at all. I guess in some places, and at least that's the reports I heard. Um, so I asked folks, you know, to to share a little bit. Um, and what I was wanting people to share, though, is not so much we know about, we could all talk about where we were, we know what we were doing when it happened, we all have those stories, we could fill the rest of the day with those stories. We certainly could see all of the, talk about the bad things that happened. But I'm wondering if you might share with each other, just, we'll just take a few moments, shout out a few things, what are the good things that came out of it? What good came out of 9-11 20 years ago? We reunited, 
Anything else? Yep, yeah, Mike? It reminded us of how we need to let go of what we believe to be in our control and trust God. Trust God more? Anything else? Apparently we were told it was going to be Christmas Day. For a little while, wasn't it? Yeah. No? Anything else? Good stuff. So we cherish life more, bring the value back, huh? more appreciative, more grateful. Right, here's, here's an interesting little factoid um, that I, I thought was pretty cool. There's actually a guy who has a podcast who's a, he's a retired uh, and disabled uh, EMS worker, I think he was a fireman, uh, from New York City that now lives in Nashville. And he was interviewed on a program. and. Uh, his podcast is all about trying to lift up all the good things that came out of 9-11. And he's a gentleman who's currently suffering from respiratory issues and stuff brought on from working uh, at, the, at the Twin Towers when that all happened at the Towers, as so many people are and have already succumbed to in this life. Um, and one of the things that stuck in my mind that he said was, of all of the first responders that passed away, uh, at Ground Zero and or at the at the World Trade Centers, uh, 65 of their children have become have become first responders, and these were children who were born after 9/11 that never knew their parent. I thought, yeah, that, that's pretty inspirational. I, that, that's amazing. I bet there's 65 amazing stories, huh? Um, so there were good things that came out of it. And it brings to mind, you know, it's, it's true. God's word is always true. That it is true what, it, what Paul speaks about in Romans. You know, that all things work together for good for those who are called according to God's purpose. And we can see it throughout life. Not just in those, not just for Christians. But there's lots of cases of where there's darkness and evil and destruction and tragedy. And when you're down the road from it a ways and look back, you can see the good that comes from it. We're going to talk a little bit later in the message. The word narcissism may come up, and some of us may not really know what that word means. We live in a culture, by the way, that is narcissism is a really big problem. And where nar the word narcissism comes from was there was, now somebody correct me if I'm wrong, was it, this was a, a Greek thing. It was a Greek story. Mythology. It was Greek mythology. This character called, is it Narcissus? Narcissus? Narcissus. Narcissus was this dude who was totally like taken with himself. He was like, he thought he was the greatest thing, gift of God to women, right? He was beautiful. And he just thought, I mean, he couldn't, he just loved himself so much. And the gods were upset about this. Now remember, this is mythology. So the mythic gods... We're, we're like, we're, we need to set this guy straight. I'm probably getting the story a little bit wrong, but the general story is. So he comes to a pond, and he gets some water to drink some water out of the pond. And he sees his image, his reflection in the water. And he's so stunned by it. And the gods cause him to not be able to take his eyes off of his image. And he's frozen there staring at himself. And he dies there because he can't take his eyes away from his own image. And he dies. And he decays. And guess what grows up out of the ground after he's dead and gone? A beautiful flower grows up. You want to get, anybody want to guess what the name of that flower is that we still have today? A narcissist, right? <laughs> yeah, that's where that whole story comes from. But the interesting, but note the point in it is that out of something that was bad, something beautiful came out from it, right? Something that we would consider a sin today, something good came from it. It's a story, it's a cute little story, you know, but it has a point and it has a lesson for us today to remember that no matter how bad things get, no matter how terrible you feel, and what the world's throwing at you, eventually things are going to turn around. If nothing else, because we have Jesus Christ, because we know we are, Jesus is our Lord and Savior, we know that even if this body dies, the next, very next, in the flash of an eye, the next moment is going to be more awesome than anything any of us has ever experienced or could imagine. So, it's all good. <laughs> all right. Well, hey, join.
joys and concerns. Anything anybody would like to lift up today? Yes, Mr. Mike. I mean, Sharon travels home from Las Vegas tomorrow, so just travel mercies for her. Sharon's travels, sure. Okay, Bill. Sunburn of this fair was probably a record breaker from what I'm understanding. Uh, pretty cool. And uh, if any of you were there, you got to see it firsthand. So it was a, a wonderful time had by all, I think. Um, yeah. All right. Well, let us come before our Lord in prayer then. Merciful God in Christ Jesus, you call believers to the new and living way of the gospel. And so we give you thanks that we are numbered among those who are chosen. Lord, give us confidence to step up to the brink of uncertainty and to face the abyss of our doubt. We give thanks for Jesus who cries out for you to save us since we are afraid of what the future might bring. Certainly in times such as these, we are concerned for our futures, for our children's future, grandchildren. <coughs> Help us to feel the comfort of the Spirit surrounding us. Help us to feel the assurance that the Spirit gives us that we are not alone, especially on the most lonely of days in the darkest of valleys. Help us to hear anew the testimony of those who have gone before us. To hear the testimony that you don't forsake us. We may feel alone, but we are not alone. Your hand is upon us always. We thank you that you do not forsake us, but you put our trust in you. Lord, turn our heads from gazing on what has been the security of the past and help us to accept the vision and promise of your glorious reign in the future. Give us courage then. Courage to take leaps of faith. Leaps of faith that transport us from the known to the unknown, from idolatry to obedience, from selfishness to service. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, who himself spanned the chasm from death to life. From him, we learn of your will as he makes known your commandments. Through him, we can obey you since he intercedes on our behalf. And because of Jesus, we shall henceforth serve you, for he calls us to repent and follow him. Forgetting what lies behind, we can press on to approach the portals of your kingdom and give you thanks for Jesus. Jesus, who shows us forevermore the new and living way. 
Lord, we do pray for all those who still are affected by 9-11. These 20 years later, so many who perished on that day, many more who would have illnesses and die as time goes on, and those who are dying still today. We pray, Lord, for those who protected this nation, whether within our borders or outside of them around the world. We pray for those left behind who remember their loved ones, whether military, EMS, victims, those children who have grown up without a father or without a mother or both, for those children who never knew anything but the stories. Lord, we pray for those who are still being left, those who are still mourning today, for those who travel to memorials, to holy ground. Lord, have mercy. Lord God, we also lift up to you those who we've spoken of today for Lowen as she undergoes another test. We pray for clarity and for healing. Lord, we lift up to you those who travel, like Sharon, that you would bring her back to Mike safe and sound and get life back to normal around their house. We lift up to you, Bill, and we ask that Bill's procedure would go well back home all on the same day and all good to go. We pray for Becky's dad in this season of his life as he navigates life a little, a little less sturdy, but for all of us, Lord, who find all of a sudden one day we're told we need to use a walker or we need to use a cane, and it's hard to put our pride aside, to lose our independence, but Lord, it's cute, but it's true. Pride does come before the fall. May we put our pride aside and take care of ourselves and just be a little wise. After all, as we age, we're to get more wise, aren't we? And we give you thanks for wisdom. We pray, Lord, for Vicki, that, Lord, you would heal the cancer in her body. We ask that you would heal those who are struggling with COVID, uh, the resurgence, uh, the, the various strains, those who are who have been vaccinated and yet they get a breakthrough case. Lord, we pray that it is not very uh, severe. We pray for those who are have other circumstances at the same time, like expectant mothers and other illnesses. Illnesses, that is. And Lord, we lift up to you, Ed, as well. All those in our hearts and in our minds have been left unsaid. Um, those who will come to our minds as our day and week progress. And may we always remember that because Jesus is Lord and he intercedes on our behalf, we shall serve him as Lord. For he prays for us. He loves us. And he calls us to repent and to follow him. To forget the past. Forget what lies behind and press on. Look forward to the future. The future kingdom. And give thanks for Jesus, who shows us forevermore the new and living way and who also teaches us even how to pray. As we pray together, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. And know that the Lord God has given us many, many gifts. He's been generous to us. May we follow his lead with our generosity and give of our hearts. And we praise him. May this be our act of praise for all the loving gifts that God grants us. And now we bring him our gifts.
in our generation, our, past gen our parents' and grandparents' generation for why church attendance is the way it is nowadays in most of our churches in America. I'm past that. It's not about blame. The reality is, times haven't changed at all. The kids nowadays or the young people, even my age, seek the warm and fuzzy stuff to be entertained. And that's even if they attempt to go to a church. The reality is, there's not as many people in church because there aren't as many people, period. Our, the population has dwindled in America. People aren't having kids like they used to. Not like our generations in the past. A lot of kids aren't even getting married or have any interest in a spouse or having children. One might even say a lot of, a lot of them seek same-sex relationships. They seek after things of their own understanding, not that of God. And so here we are. The faithful, praise God. But the people back then, they desired to be wooed with prophecies depicting good times in the days of old. They wanted to walk the path. Actually, I should change this. They wanted to walk through the door that the world walked through. They wanted to walk through the door that offered the least amount of resistance and, that be, and to be guaranteed on the other side of that door life was going to be easy and good and fun and prosperous instead of walking the path of righteousness. Why do I say door? A door is easy to walk through. Think about it. A door, you walk through it, one and done. It's a moment, a flash in time when you walk through a door. But when you walk a path, it goes on and on. The scenery changes. The experiences change as you go along the path. And when you apply to that the path of walking the, right, the righteous path with Jesus Christ, there are challenges all along the way. And we know we don't grow in our faith without a challenge and without being stressed and twisted and molded. The world desires to walk through a door of security, a door where they will find rest, a door where they will, where they will find no demands on the other side. Paul, on the other hand, in Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, is praising the church of Colossae for being faithful to God, the God of Israel and Jesus Christ. Paul's pointing out their faithfulness and the concern that others are, he's very concerned because others are introducing into the church smooth things, slick stuff, prophecies of illusions and lies that will lead them to turn aside from the Lord Jesus Christ and seek after things of their own understanding, and their own desires and construction, and no longer walk with Jesus Christ. Listen to the words of Paul in Colossians chapter 2. One through seven. Paul writes, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full, the full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. Paul's talking about a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, a Christian, will be known by their walk. A Christian will be known by the words they use. A, a Christian will be known by what appears on their Facebook wall. A Christian will be known. The words you use, 
I was, fa I was, I was fascinated by something yesterday. Um, I don't know if, how many of you are aware, uh, for the last three years and for the next two years, I, I'm involved in a, in a research study that Grove City College is doing on rural ministry. Uh, and mainly it focuses on the clergy, I've, I've come to find out. It, it started out, it was supposed to be the churches and the pastors, and it's kind of got whittled down to focusing on supporting the, the pastors, but in effect by supporting the pastors or supporting the churches. So anyways, but they're doing this study and the money was through the Lilly Foundation, and it's really pretty cool. And Grove City College, the more I learn about it, the more I interact with its professors and, and people there, the more impressed I am with that institution that's right in our backyard. Uh, and I think we'll be seeing some benefits from that relationship in the future. That is my hope and prayer. Um, but anyway, there's, so we had our, our fall, annual fall gathering. Uh, and got a little bit of education going on and exposed to some different things. And um, so there's all kinds of pastors there from around the region, from West Virginia, Ohio, New York State, and Pennsylvania. And there's all, and we're all Protestants of all various flavors. And um, I was fascinated, I was shocked. You know, it takes a lot to shock me. As I remind folks, I was a truck driver, so I don't like just like wilt at the slightest little bit of coarse language or anything, you know. Nothing I haven't heard before. <laughs> but I was a little shocked and a little taken aback. And even as I shared this at Union on the way over here, as I was thinking about the comment I made, I'm going to make to you in a moment, another thought popped into my head. And it's an, it shows how the world today is. A... Uh, a pastor stood up and she was sharing, I don't, even, I don't even remember what she was talking about. Because all I heard was she said the S word. The four letter S word. In a gathering of clergy, supposedly educated people. And it just shocked me. Because to me, that wasn't the place. I mean, you know, I've told you this a million times, right? My granddad said it's okay to say the word, but you can only say it in the barn because that's where you keep it. Yeah, I live by that. Oh, not to say that I haven't said it when I hit my thumb or something with a hammer, but you know, who hasn't, right? But but there's a place somehow for these things, right? And I was just a little bit like, what? You know, it was a little coarse language. But then I also was thinking on the way over here, at the same time that that, that, that word was used, and nobody seemed to, I don't know, I'm sure other people raised an eyebrow too, but... But nobody said anything. In that same time frame, after we came back from a break, somebody talked to the presenter and expressed their concern because they were offended by an image he used. And in his PowerPoint, he had a, an image of a, like a stock pot with vegetables and water and stuff in it and a piece of meat. And he was using that illustration to talk about how, about how the culture uses children like a piece of meat. You know, with the marketing and things like that in our world. And, I, and it's a little hard for you all to understand the context, but I got, I didn't think anything of it. Well, I, it actually, when he said it that way, I was like, eh, might have chose a better way to put that in this day and age, but, but I got what he was saying. Somebody was offended and he apologized after the break for using that image. But a clergy person who was wearing a collar can stand up and say the S word in a mixed crowd at a event like that. And I was just a little like, my, how we're twisted around. Or maybe I'm just an old buddy-duddy and not with the program anymore, I don't know. As much as things change, they say the same. This is the very kind of stuff that Isaiah goes on and on and on about. That's going on, was going on all those thousands of years ago. And it still goes on today, how twisted up God's people get. It will be obvious to all those who walk in the light of Jesus Christ when you walk in the light of Christ. That sounds weird. Christians walk upright in the light with joy, and they, sh and they shine the light of God's glory in their faces. You'll know us by our walk, right? The Christian will walk with an ethic of morality, a rhythm of faith, a rhythm of joy and hope and love. The Christian walk is one of gratitude 
Gratitude for the privilege of salvation. Gratitude for and a, and a desire to be continually shaped and molded by the many graces of God. But unfortunately, some Christians and those yet to meet Jesus Christ have the misconception of the faith. That to walk with Jesus is all uphill. To walk with Jesus is full of burdens, backpacks full of rocks, full of rules and labors under all kinds of oppression and do's and don'ts and rules. Some Christians portray a poor witness because their motivation, they're motivated to follow Jesus out of fear of punishment, a sense of duty, or a need to be needed, or a hope for some reward in this life for the next. The Christian life is not about willpower or our effort. The Christian life is about walking the path of relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's to be walked for all to see, not to be hidden. And people see it because of our gratitude. Our gratitude is obvious and our character of thankfulness develops and grows. The good news is that the mystery Paul speaks of, the mystery is Christ in those who believe, and Christ carries with him the hidden treasures of the knowledge and the wisdom which are in Christians like us. So if you claim to be a Christian, walk like a Christian. Walk with him and be thankful. So in this lesson, as we get to the meat of what Paul is writing to Colossians, he's be he begins to set up an argument. An argument for confronting the false teachers that were beginning to show up in Colossae. And the trouble is, some seek more knowledge and more wisdom that is in, than is in Christ. They think that the, culture influ the cultural influence sh should be brought into the mix. In other words... They're in danger of going down the same path as the Hebrew children that Isaiah was addressing. And I would argue that today, in the church of Jesus Christ, we too struggle with the same challenges. Some in Colossae were seeking something more, something new, something great, something wonderful that would be more fair and more inclusive. Something different that was smooth and tickled their fancy with the warm and the fuzzy. They desire to be accepting of all people, no matter how immoral or misguided they are. And who says one behavior is immoral and another belief is misguided anyway? Can't we all just get along? The problem in Isaiah's time and in Paul's time and in our day today are those who seek their own understanding and follow natu the natural man. Nothing new under the sun. We will know when our walk with Christ is growing in our relationship and when our character is one of gratitude and thanksgiving for the walk and not the desire for security and that feel-good universalism or syncretism like we talked about before. We will know we are walking in a relationship with Jesus Christ when we take the hard stand of committing ourselves to a relationship that grows in the knowledge that's revealed in the authority of Scripture and guided by the Holy Spirit, not by the authority of growing social trends, wokeness, and not guided by the pie-in-the-sky desire for those who hang on to the error of universalism and human knowledge and human wisdom, claiming to seek unity in the body of Christ at any cost, and putting Christ out and bringing the world in. Because Jesus sometimes left some out. You remember the story of the, the bridesmaids? The story about the sheep and the goats? Those are hard teachings, especially in the culture we live in today. So as long as we remain in Christ, we are not in danger. But when we are no longer satisfied with the teachings of Jesus Christ and want to have our own teaching, we will be at risk of falling to every deception and every fallacy. So let's talk about a hard teaching, something that's totally relevant to our day and age today, something that's been in the news for the last couple of weeks. Let's talk about abortion. Now, I'll bet 
maybe I won't bet. I'm thinking maybe there might be a little bit of a variety of opinion here and beliefs. And, and maybe I shouldn't ask for a raise show of hands of who's for and who's against. I don't want any division. And I would like to think that in the church of all places in America, that the church is the one place that we could express our feelings and be accepted and loved and have a difference of opinions and still love each other and there would not be any mud throwing or anger or anything like that. Or you're evil and you're, you're too conservative or you're too this or that. I, we can have a difference even on things like abortion. If, if, so let's try it. See if you have the courage to speak up. Um, show, show of hands, why not? Let's go for it. Let's be brave. Show of hands, how many anti-abortion do we got here? And you don't have to participate if you don't want to. How many are pro-abortion? Maybe you're a little more nervous. Okay. So, so if we are for abortion, now let's start with the antis first. Let me, if you are anti-abortion, why is abortion wrong in your mind? Why should it not be? Why should somebody not have an abortion? Anybody want to venture a, I mean, this, is tough, this is tough, right? But it's real. This is really relevant. Does the baby should not be kept from her kid? And the baby has the ability to come to their own sex. Yeah. Have a sexual relationship. Okay. Yeah, a baby's a person. Even, even at, at, what, at conception? Or do we want to draw lines at timelines or anything? I know it gets really, it gets deep, doesn't it? Mike? Uh, this is the even deeper. Keep it quick. A lot of times people who have abortions uh, are in very difficult situations and they will pay for that the rest of their lives emotionally. So you have to consider that. If they have the abortion. Yes. Okay. Huh? Her choice, okay. Okay, to choose whether to live with that or what, however they want, yeah. Okay. How about, let's look at the Bible, because we are in church. We are made in God's image, right? That might be a good reason not to have abortions. And let's be clear, abortions killing a baby. Some might argue that too, but sorry, that's my bias. I believe what the Bible says. I am anti-abortion. But at the same time, okay, so we're made in God's image. Murder is a sin. That's a big biggie, right? So those are a couple of really good reasons to be against abortion. But at the same time, I'm probably like some of, some of you. There's a big part of me that struggles with the, what about, in, what about the exceptions? Rape and incest, right? But yet I've heard stories and I've seen personal testimony of people and children who were born in those situations that came out pretty darn good and lived a great life and, very, and contributed to society and their parents were blessed and somehow or other the, the mom survived it all and became a, a, a witness. That happens. And I've always said, man, I've never had to counsel with, with a family who was dealing with rape or incest and questioning the abortion thing and I, and I dread the day because in the end I'm kind of like you guys it's it, they have to live with it it's their choice I would never want to be in that situation what a horrific situation and yet I know that God has promises that he's made and I know that killing this creation is wrong those are tough teachings that's hard stuff, and I'm not judging you if you are for or against. That's not what I'm saying here today. But what I'm talking about, though, is looking at God's Word and what God's Word says about those who are Christians, those who walk in the light of Jesus Christ. There is a line in the sand. And if we go against God's Word, if killing a human life, willfully killing a human, willfully killing, okay, planning it and stuff, if that is murder, if we are created in God's image and to be, to be protected and loved and treated the way Christ tells us to teach, treat one another, whether we are, have seen the light of day yet or not, it's 
wrong to kill that baby. And we can't make exceptions. We should not make exceptions. And if we do, then we're disobe willfully disobeying Jesus Christ and not, no longer claiming him as Lord. We're making ourselves Lord. And we see it in our culture all the time. I bring up the big hot button issue of abortion because it's such a great <laughs> illustration, unfortunately, of what I'm trying to get across is that any time that we make up our own rules, every any time we want to create our own exception to situations of life that come up that the word speaks to, that God gives us his desire for, and that we make exceptions, we are our own Lord at that point in time. And don't sit there and try to think, well, I can compartmentalize. I'll, I'll do my little thing over here and have my rules over here, but I'm going to hold the Bible over here. So on Sunday morning and when I'm with my Christian friends and all that and everything, I'll, I'll do this, but in this little topic over here, I'm going to do my own thing. It doesn't work that way. God's an all or none God. He wants all of you. And so when we're doing this thing over here and ignoring God's word over here, we are no longer claiming Jesus Christ as Lord. We're claiming we're Lord. His rule's not mine. Israel was rebuked for that kind of stuff. And he rebukes us because he loves us. And Israel was redeemed. And when God was no longer worshipped, when people sought after other gods, and they sacrificed babies, in those days, they sacrificed babies to Marduk and Baal. Satan figures, all right? And it's fascinating that in this day and age that we're still doing the same thing, maybe for different reasons. And we want to make it legal to use abortion as birth control. I'm sorry, but there's lots of ways to have other kinds of birth control way before you get to that point. And good grief, abstinence works every time it's tried, right? in this day and age, but we still do it. We still sacrifice babies to Marduk and Baal. And I've always wondered, how many children have we killed who had the cure to a cancer? How many children have we killed that had some amazing gift in them of music or a play? Science. Really? And so the people back then, you know, they sought power and wealth over caring for others. And God still cared enough to rescue them even again. And he's offering us the same opportunity, an opportunity of rescue. The good news is that with Christ in us, we can carry within us the hidden treasures and the knowledge and the wisdom of God, which are in Christ in us. And if you claim to be a believer, a Christian, walk with him. Abounding in thanksgiving. Ah, thanksgiving. Let's get on to something a little bit brighter. This brings me to the point of gratitude. When we walk the path of faith with Christ, we not only have a measure of wisdom and knowledge to protect us from false teaching that leads us away from Christ, but we will have a character of gratitude. And if you got gratitude going on, all the other stuff is gone. Gratitude, the best illustration I can come up for with gratitude, and I've shared this with some of you when you get dogs and stuff. Dogs, man. And those of you that are dog people, there is no, but no creature that shows gratitude more than a dog. To prove my point, lock your spouse and your dog in the trunk of your car in the morning, go to work, and when you come back and open the trunk, see which one's grateful to see you. Amen? <laughs> A person of mine years ago told me that, and I, that was the, I've never forgot that story. Because it's true. I see it in Gus all the time. Don't leave your gun in the trunk. Don't, don't leave the gun in the trunk either. Yeah, that's probably not good. Anyway, so, so I mean, Gus, look at this dog. Now, I, you know, I can tell the story because we're, we're dog people, and we're, we're in the country, and there's hunters here and stuff, so you'll get what I mean. So in deer season, when I get a deer, and I, I butcher my own, I save some of the big bones and stuff, and I throw them in the freezer. And then in the summertime, I pull him out on a hot summer day with Gus out on the porch, and I give him one of these frozen bones. And this dog, I mean, 
He's grateful most of the time just for even a little tiny, a teeny tiny little training treat he'll take. I mean, this dog licks, if I, if I wipe my fingers after cooking bacon on my pants, like I did on the way in here, by the way, I'll admit that. Later on, when I get home, that dog will be snorting that spot on my pant leg. Right? Because he's so, even just for the essence of bacon, he's grateful. So when I give him this bone, which, by the way, my wife is not happy when I give him a bone, because then he has what my sister calls about her dog. He has fluffies later on in the evening. You can imagine what fluffies are. <laughs> but he loves that bone, and he will chew on that bone, and he will suck it clean till it's as white as those tissue papers in the pews. And that bone will lay out there, and he'll play with it and gnaw on it and everything for the next week or two. And it'll be bleached white, and it'll roll off into the flower bed, and a few weeks later he'll find it with beetles and bugs crawling through it. And there's no, no vitamins or minerals, or there's no value left in that bone. And he'll find it, and he'll prance around the yard with his head up in the air going, Look what my daddy got me. He is the best master in the whole wide world. Shouldn't we be better than a dog when it comes to gratitude to our master who has saved us for salvation? Amen. Yeah? Shouldn't we? I mean, my dog, I don't know about you all, but my dog drools when he sees food. Or when you hold a treat, he will leave a puddle between his paws. And sometimes on my foot. At the slightest little thing, when he thinks he's going to get something good, that's how thankful he is. Shouldn't we be so thankful for God's word, even when it contradicts and challenges us in our long-held beliefs and things we want to be true? And shouldn't we be drooling at his word because we're so happy for it and thankful for it? Wouldn't that be awesome? What a prize we get in our faith. What if we Christians were so thankful for the treat of salvation in Christ? What if we had so much gratitude for the meat and the marrow of wisdom and the knowledge of Jesus Christ that we never gave up witnessing Christ and we sought more and more knowledge and wisdom in Christ and did all that we could to grow and to walk with him every day? What if we drooled at, at the anticipation of the reading and the preaching and devouring of God's word in whatever way we could get it? What if we were so grateful for Jesus that even, even if we lost our way, followed our nose into some thicket somewhere and got lost. And Jesus found us. We were so grateful that we would prance around town showing everyone Jesus is in us. We would have gratitude, and we would have it abundantly. And that's what Paul's trying to teach us when he says, As you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught abounding in thanksgiving. The lack of gratitude for faith is usually the first reason for the lack of Christ in us and other divine gifts that lead us off in the wrong direction. A Christian will be known by their walk. We will have the wisdom and the knowledge of Christ in us and a character of gratitude when we nurture and when we grow our relationship with Jesus Christ along the path of faith, when we walk the path of faith with Jesus, we will be strong, strong in the face of false teaching and wise in the ways of Christ. We will be willing to invest in the relationship and to say to false idols and teachings, be gone. And on that day, we will hear our teacher say, this is the way, this is the way. You are my child. Walk, walk in. Walk with me. This is the way. Walk in. Amen. <sighs> Fire in the room stone. Maybe. A little pepper today. A little pepper. Let us sing together in a moment here, Battle Hymn of the Republic. First, I'm going to give, give the benediction and Man, am I in trouble. I should have been gone 15 minutes ago. Friends, please, please, we are allowed to have various opinions and strong opinions and strong beliefs and feelings in various ways. The one thing we can't compromise on, though, is that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
He is our Savior, and we have that in common. Love one another. Be gracious to one another as Jesus Christ has been gracious to us and loved us. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you in spirit, brothers and sisters. Know that you are blessed children. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Alleluia. Amen.